Howdy once again, Mr. Pete here out in Studio G. One of the last videos I can make this year before the weather turns cold here in Illinois. So I'm sitting here in front again of the 9 inch South Bend lathe and I'm going to do video number two, which is tips number 1064 on the Vivor three jaw chuck that was gifted to me by Vivor. And I hope you watch 1063 where I did several tests on the uh, three jaw chuck to see how accurate it was out of the box. Well, there's a little inaccuracy as there is in most three jaw chucks. Two or three or four thousands is kind of what you would expect, especially for a chuck that only cost about $150, quite of value. Nothing uh, like an American chuck, which might be five, six hundred, even more dollars. So this one is affordable for you guys down in your workshop basements or perhaps out in your garage. Now if you're interested in one of these chucks, look down below in the video description and there's a link of how you can order one or look at them online. Uh, you, you'll find the price quite attractive as I just said and also there's a discount code there so you get a few percent off if you are interested. Now what I'm going to do in this video, I'm going to go back and uh, double check the accuracy using a more accurate ground stock that's truly round and compare the two and then I want to remove the chuck from the backing plate and counter bore those uh, big cap screws that stick out. I find that quite objectionable as some of you did as well. And then one last thing I want to do is several of you said well you can probably loosen up the backing plate and tap the chuck body around a little bit. Well, I don't know how much clearance there is to do that, but I will give that a try in that I'm going to take the backing plate off anyway to do the counterboring. So let's begin. There were several valid suggestions in the video comments for the last video. So this is the half inch cold roll steel that I used for the test and granted it's probably not perfectly round. I'm going to check that in a minute and we'll see. Also some suggested well you need to use a larger diameter so it's not all that large but it's three quarter instead of half and this is ground stock that is this is a piece of drill rod. I got to stay away from the little corrosion we got right here but we know this to be pretty darn round. Well we don't really know that but uh, I'll run that through the test real quick. So let me do that and then I'm going to test these for roundness the best that I can with my primitive method. Again this is the half inch coal rolled and let me turn this a few turns and you can see as in the previous video it's three or four thousandths total indicator run out. Let me put that ground stock in and see if there's any difference. And now the three quarter ground stock no better at all. We're still at about four thousandths. So it's the chuck, not the stock. Okay, I'm using a Taft Pierce V-block, one of the most quality V-blocks known to mankind. And I put uh, this half inch round stock in there and I got an indicator set up. And I'm just going to rotate this as the best I can and we'll see how far out of round it is. Watch the indicator needle. There's just a little bit of movement, maybe two tenths of a thousandth at best. Let's try the ground stock. Three quarter ground stock. Get it right on zero. Again, just a little bit of fluctuation. Part of it is when this raises up as I'm rotating it. So both of these pieces of material are really 
very round or as, as close as we can figure it out. Now, when I worked at Caterpillar, there was a piece of uh, test equipment, inspection equipment that was used to test roundness. It was 10 times more accurate than this. They were made in England. I can't think of the name of the company, but uh, there were graphs that would show up on a screen to show if there was any out of roundness. So there, there is equipment that can check that so much more accurately than this. But as you can see, there appears to be no bends in the stock and no out of roundness. So why did, what did I prove by this? That the, the critics, and I'm one of them, uh, you know, said use ground stock for more accuracy, but it didn't seem to make a whole lot of difference, did it? Let's go measure something else. Okay, get a load of this setup. I got the magnetic base down on the uh, cabinet or the table itself. And I'm going to check two things here. I'm going to check the run out of the chuck body. Notice I had to position the tip of the indicator off to the side of the uh, uh, square hole here and away from the chuck jaws. That's why I'm way out of here. So I'm going to check this and then I'm going to put the indicator onto the backing plate and see how accurate that is. Let me move the camera real quickly. Okay, I'm checking the run out on the body of the chuck right now, and you can see that it's there's not much Probably about two thousandths run out on the body. That's quite good And now I'm checking the run out on the backing plate only not the chuck That's very good only about a thousandth run out That's better than the chuck what I'm going to do now is loosen all three of these cap screws. Now here's another example of a backing plate. One and a half inch by eight threads. This was off one of my Logans. So the backing plate has been turned in the diameter right here where the step is so that it would be a real good fit on the chuck. Now how good a fit this is, I do not know. But after I loosen up the three screws, I'm going to tap it, I'll put the indicator back on there, and tap it and see if I'm able to center it any better than what it was. That is, is there any play at all? And I kind of doubt it, or it'll be minimal play. But in other words here, in some ways I'm thinking about this in terms of a, a just a true buck chuck, which is essentially a three jaw chuck within a four jaw chuck. And there are several other brands of uh, chucks that uh, allow you that adjustment as well. They're, uh, they're chucks that cost a little more, certainly more than this. You're probably in the $800 or $1,000 range. All right, let me loosen those up off camera. It takes a six millimeter uh, Allen wrench, and uh, then I'm going to take it off, as I said, and counterbore these three holes. All three cap screws are backed off just a little bit, and I'm going to tap the chuck now and see if I can make the indicator, not make it, uh, see if the indicator moves. Well, that's just vibration. So what I'm thinking is this is a pretty darn good fit on that, the step of the backing plate, as I just showed you. So I'm satisfied that I probably cannot bring it in to uh, any more accuracy by manipulating the chuck within the backing plate. I hope you understand what I mean. Well, now I'm going to take the indicator off, remove the screws, almost, and uh, tap the chuck until it comes off. But I will put an index mark on here because I want to put it back together the same one hour from now. All right, these are backed way off. Let's see if it comes loose. Ah, quite easily, actually. Don't smash your fingers. The screws are out and I do not feel any movement. I'm not able to nudge it one way or the other. So off it comes. Wow, it's perfectly clean in there. But what the heck, it looks like a piece of plastic. I don't understand it. All right, now I will take the backing plate off of the lathe spindle. So what I want to do, again, I've told you five times, I think, I want to counterbore these cap screws such that they will be 
in that position. So I have to counter bore them quite deep, but I just got to thinking there might be a problem. Now these are metric, so I can't go down to eighths and buy three that are slightly shorter, but I ran this screw all the way into the chuck as far as it will go, and this just goes to prove that these are going to be just a little bit too long. So I won't show any of that, but I think I will have to chop off about three sixteenths of an inch with my abrasive wheel. No biggie, but I'd rather not have to do it. Very interesting. I removed the three screws that holds this part in there, and this is plastic. I never thought I'd see plastic in a three-jaw chuck. But think of how much cheaper that would be to make once the mold has been made than to machine it. So I guess that's one of the ways they're uh, reducing costs, and that we can buy it for that price. But I would prefer that this was iron, but it is what it is. But another thing I wanted to show you while I got this apart, it is incredibly clean in there. I don't see chips, but the only reason, uh, the only way to determine that would be to take it totally apart, flush it with clean kerosene, and then examine uh, for particle matter. But the other thing that surprises me here, a lot of oil, as you can see, and remember, it, some of it slung out on my shirt in the other video. But there's virtually no grease on the gear or these pinions. So when I reassemble this, I will put some gear uh, grease on there, or just some grease, I guess. I, I'm rather surprised because sometimes they got so much grease inside of these things, it's, it's a real mess. Now, you have watched me in other videos take a three-jaw chuck apart, so I guess there's no no need to do that in this one. Sometimes it's called a scroll chuck, sometimes it's called a um, universal chuck. So I'm going to put a little grease in there off camera and remount the plastic. I'm going to use some of this multi-service lubricating grease and uh, not too much because some of it ultimately will liquefy and get slung out on my shirt. So just about that much on each side and then it'll work in. A little bit on the pinion gears and a couple revolutions with the key and that'll spread nicely. Now that I'm thinking about it, it could matter less what this is made out of because there's no structural, it's not a structural component whatsoever, it's just like a guard or a shield. Probably could be made out of heavy paper and would work just as well. So I'll put those three screws back. I'm in Studio B at the Bridgeport. Pay no attention to the dividing head. It has nothing to do with it. So I've got all of these counter bores, plus more in the other room. But of course, none of them are the correct size because these are metric screws. But it just so happens that the diameter here of the head is just a little bit under half inch. So I'm using a half inch end mill to open up the hole because uh, it'll give me a nice flat bottom shoulder for which the uh, cap screw can rest up against. Now I've already aligned the spindle with the hole. Notice how I've got this, maybe you can't see how I've got it uh, held down because I didn't want to do this on the drill press because there is this little space underneath here. So if it isn't clamped properly as you start drilling or milling, it's going to push the work down. Then it's going to spin around, it's going to break the cutter and break my wrist. So that's a safe way of doing it. So I will bring this up against the work, lock the spindle, and raise the knee 315 thousandths. Correct depth. All right. Alrighty, I cleaned it thoroughly and I have it oriented correctly according to my index mark. 
and I'll put the three screws back in and it turns out that I will not have to grind the screws off. They are going to work, but I think just barely. I put one drop on the spindle thread and back on the machine goes the uh, Viver chuck. Okay. I'll put the indicator on it, but I do not expect it to be any different. Okay, final check. And it's still about three and a half thousandths off which is what it was to start with. So I didn't make any correction or improvement in the accuracy, and I didn't expect to. And I sure do like these counterboard screws. Nothing to catch your fingers or a rag on. They should have done that at the factory. Well, that concludes this short chapter on the Vivor Chuck. Hope you liked it. Remember, if you're interested in one of these, look at the description below. This is Mr. Pete saying so long for now. Remember, I got 1,500 other videos. Check them out. See you next time.